Damien has been an ally and friend for a long time. I mean, I think it was about 10 years ago, I drove to uh, very far um, west of Wales for a conference that Damien had set up about welfare, social care, disability rights. Um, and he became a fellow, of, one of the early fellows of the Centre for Welfare Reform. But it's really exciting to work with him a bit more closely now as the Centre has launched the Co-op for Welfare Reform and Damien and others are starting to come together to organise practical work to bring about change in communities. And I'm really pleased that we get the chance to hear more about Wales because there has been some very exciting developments in Wales but they're not well understood outside Wales. There haven't been many opportunities to really hear uh, in England or Scotland what those things are and so this is a chance for Damien to give us a, an introduction to that and uh, Damien you can say a little bit more about how you're going to do this but there will be a film a little bit of talk from Damien and then a chance for us to ask questions. So I remind people that the chat bar is quite useful. If you want to put questions in early, we can come to those later as well. If you, if you want to speak or ask a question later on, sometimes people use the letter H to mean that they've kind of got a virtual hand up. Um, all of the webinars that we record are placed on the Citizen Network webinar page um, uh, after this event and um, we'll probably include this in our neighborhood democracy series because I think this links to themes around how power and control can be brought closer to people in their own communities. Uh, is that enough of an introduction Damien what do you want to say? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just start off by giving a bit of a disclaimer um, because I work with government, I have to do this. Um, these are my views and shouldn't be construed as any one of the organizations I work with views. Um, I'm, here in, I'm here in my capacity as a fellow of the Center of Welfare Reform, but I would love to have a detailed and rich conversation with you around that. One thing I will ask Simon to do is, because of my dyslexia, um, if you could um, manage people who want to have conversations, because I won't be able to read them going through my talk. So if there is anything um, pertinent, just flag it to me, Simon, and we can cover it in the talk. And, and I'm to take questions and have offline conversations with people as we move forward. So Simon, can you show the video, please? Sure. So, um, just give me a second. <clears throat> so this is a film on YouTube, I think produced by um, the Welsh Government, uh, Social Services and Wellbeing Act. Um, do that, press that. What matters to you matters to us. The Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act. The Welsh Government and Councils are changing the way we do things, making your care and support the best it can be to help you to live the life you choose and stay independent for longer. We want to improve the way we do things in Wales. From April 2016, the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act is law. This changes how councils and care services work. The Act is based on five themes. For you to have a voice, be in control and make decisions about your life. We will work with you to keep you well and to see when you need support. We will work with you to help you get what matters to you and is important. For you to be involved in how your care and support is decided and provided. Everyone will work together to help you to live the life you choose for longer.
In this act, well-being means people are healthy, feel good about their life, are safe and protected, and can learn new things. Also for adults, it means having control over their life and being able to work. For children, well-being means being able to grow up happily and being looked after well. The well-being of people who need care and support and carers who need support is at the heart of the Act. Everyone in Wales has a right to well-being and a responsibility for their own well-being. Some people need help to achieve this. We want to change the way we do things and have different conversations with you. We want to have the right conversation at the right time. By asking you different questions. Instead of asking, what is the matter with you? We will ask, what matters to you? So we can find out what's important to you. We want to have the right conversation with you so we can find the right solution with you. We can help you to find different solutions for the same problem, depending on what is important and matters to you. How do we do this? Our first conversation with you could be face to face, on the phone, digitally or by post. We listen and ask what can you do with and without the support of family, friends or carers, and talk with you about solutions. We can connect you with someone who can help, either by signposting you to useful people and information, or connect you with services who can discuss care and support. Our team have many resources to help that we can signpost you to, Sometimes during the first conversation we find a solution with you and you won't need any more help from us. Jim and Mo's story. Mo cares for her husband who has dementia. She called us saying Jim's depressed as he can't walk his dog Pip. He gets confused and lost. I'm tired out. We arranged for Bob to walk Pip with Jim so Mo could have some rest. Mo's also getting help from a carer's support service. Sometimes you will only need support for a short time. A short-term plan rather than a long-term care and support plan. We can help you to live the life you choose and be independent. Short-term support, Meg's story. Meg called us. She was self-employed with an injury and could not work for six more weeks. She was panicking about having money to buy her family food. We talked about what Meg had already. Her cousin lived nearby. We arranged for her to pick up some food vouchers the same day. Next, Meg called the school. Her children were able to have free dinners until she was well again. We talked to Meg about benefits. Now she was less stressed, Meg started doing her physiotherapy exercises more and taking her children to the park. She was back to normal much sooner than expected and stopped needing our help. If you need long-term care and support, we will create a plan. Before, we would have looked for solutions and created your care plan. We have changed the way we do things now we will meet with you and create your care plan with you and your carers. Finding solutions together. Before, we would have written your care and support plan and delivered it with the services that were in place when we could do it. Now, we want to listen to you and your carers to talk about opportunities and to help you get what matters to you. Care and support plan. Sow is 82 and after a bad fall had a stay in hospital. His family were worried about how he'd manage back at home as they all live far away. 
first, we had a conversation with Llew and the people who care for him and talked about what mattered to him. Llew told us he loved his home and he had lived there for over 30 years and wanted to stay there. Next, Llew was supported home from hospital so that his needs could be assessed. Then we arranged for a support worker to come every morning. They helped Llew get dressed and checked he was okay. Llew talked to his family, friends and neighbours and arranged for someone to pop in at 5pm every day. <coughs> and Llew stayed living in the home he loved. Now, whichever type of care and support you need, we start by asking, what is it about your relationships, your community and life that matters to you? We focus on you and your carer's well-being and quality of life. This is our starting point for conversations. Next, we talk to you about what you have already. Your skills and abilities, the people in your life and places in your community that are important to you. We build a picture of what you have now. Then we look at what else is available. We see what could help you to improve your well-being and stay independent for longer and then see how our services can help and work with you to find the right solution. The Welsh Government and Councils are changing the way we do things, making your care and support the best it can be to help you to live the life you choose and stay independent for longer. Thank you, Simon. As you can, as you can see, I believe mainstream media is oh, sorry, that's me. wrong in the way it's handled. <laughs> as you can see in, in that video, it changes it to have a conversation to see what the person actually wants in their lives. Why did the Welsh Government decide to do that? Y yes, it was to realign services and put them in into communities, but also it was getting hammered time and time again by people saying social services aren't listening to me. So basically the ministers came together and said we really need to do sweeping reforms and we really need to um, base any solutions that we come up with in the communities that people live. Um, some cynics might say they do that because it allows them to save money but what also goes along with this is Welsh Government will invest to save. So what I mean by that is they will put the money up front to save over the longer haul, haul of a plan. So for example, there is somebody that is currently using a support plan in Wales that's had a conversation with a community connector and said, I want to be able to play golf because I believe that helps my well-being and helps with my mental health challenges and actually Swansea have allowed that and the outcomes for that particular citizen have been really positive because he's actually doing exercise he's doing something he really wants to do and he he was unable to do it so um, the social services and well-being act was the biggest sweeping reform ever in in social care in Wales also alongside the act become a, a regulation and inspection act which means that every domiciliary carer in Wales now has to be registered and also everyone that works in a care home will soon have to be registered as well and the reason for that is because Welsh ministers believe that if they 
um, wanted these sweeping reforms, it had to be backed up by expecting people to have proper qualifications if they're going to deliver care. You've, you've already heard me talk about um, community connectors and basically community connectors are very much like a brokerage model that you would have in England. They, they are used within communities and they can be referred to from GPs, from district nurses, and they are basically people who are there to have strength-based conversations with the citizen. Because if we can have a conversation with, let's call her, let's call her Mary, and actually see what she's got around her, it's going to save it's going to save time trying to put a package around her if we might be able to support her to have her um meals on wheels service in the local cafe rather than bringing it to a house because actually she's being made part of the community so a particular cafe will be given money to run meals on wheels services um, very much like the example that Simon shared with a few of us that were on a call about Norwich and actually how those cafes were being used as hubs. That's how Welsh Government want community to be based. They want hubs. They want people to come to them with ideas for community-based services. But there is there is a wide piece still to be done about reframing the conversations for particular social work categories that have been in the profession so long. Um, and believe me, that is going on. Is there any questions so far? Just to give me a bit of a break, a second. Simon, I can't hear you. Mark has just put in a question, Damien, about just the gap between the theory and the practice. And I wonder whether you could, maybe before jumping into that, uh, bearing in mind that I think there are some folk from Wales on this call and some folk like me from England. What about just helping us understand maybe some of the things that are specific about the Welsh context, the way government works and local government works? Okay. And also the old, what kind of system of social care have, have you inherited in a way? What's okay. the state of play? Basically, we've got, we've got 22 local authorities that each have their own way of doing things. But they are, they are overseen by a devolved government, which is um, highly labour. And um, basically, we, we have also got the history of the NHS first being formed in Wales. So we have quite a lot of people that still believe in welfare being delivered cradle to grave. But if we actually carry on with that belief, we won't be able to um, cope with some of the demographic pressures that are coming down our way. So actually, this was a whole piece of legislation, basically to reframe the conversation with the citizen of Wales. And whenever you speak to ministers, they won't say people, they'll say citizen, because they want to, they want to remember that citizen is at the forefront of what they do, whether that plays out for a different, for a different day, but actually everything that social services, health, councils, and even the future of Ge future generations commissioner, everything that she does is always based around empowering the citizen to have more control in their lives. I could go on for hours on whether that actually does play out in reality, but if you look at it as a wider reform, it is actually changing the conversations. And one of the things I will always say, if you're trying to turn around a massive 
um, tanker, it takes a while to make that tanker turn. But believe me, there is passionate people like myself sitting around the table and believe me, it'll turn. It might take us some time, but does that... You know, could Mark, Mark, sorry to... How about um, you, you, you could amplify your point maybe to encourage a bit more understanding and discussion for the wider group as well. So... Um, Okay, I've got to be I've got to, got to be slightly careful as those who know me know that I wear two hats. <laughs> so I'm working on a transformation program funded by Health, Healthy Wales Welsh Government in North Wales around folk with learning disabilities. Okay. So I'm part of the system in a way. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm also co-director of a community interest company. Yeah. Uh, yeah a co-production asset-based com community development organization built from the ground up that involves citizens and based in north wales <clears throat> yeah in flintshire um okay. and i've been around a long time um okay. i also have a brother who has learning disabilities um i i i think the act says a lot of great things and the principles are brilliant but i'm just a bit worried that there's still a huge gap between uh, how that's being overseen and monitored so we have regional partnership boards in wales and they're just to me they're just the two up in the sky mm. and and I, I may be speaking more from the point of view of folk with learning disabilities but i'm not sure about that but there needs to be more investment in those citizens understanding what the act means and then there also needs to be more checking <laughs> that yeah. that's happening on the ground so i'm even in the transformation program, we've got a number of innovative projects off the ground. We're still, there's a sentence in the video about all the principles and it talks about well-being, being safe and protected. Yeah. And it still feels to me like there's a huge culture of safeguarding, DBS, yeah. protection of vulnerable adults. And people, certainly in the learning disability world, often jump into that. So when you talk about helping somebody build a, a circle of support where potentially you don't DBS check those people, you get a very often dramatic reaction where people are immediately concerned about risk. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that nobody's really dealing with in any great way. And through our transformation program, I'm hoping we're going to really raise that up and not get into the blame game, mm -hmm. but try and co-produce with people and say, why are we getting so bogged down by a negative approach to in taking positive risk, which at the end of the day will help people be safer. Yeah. <laughs> You've got and, more people around you, you're safer and yeah. you're empowered. And I, I would, I would love to, I would love to learn more about your particular project. And there is, there is wider conversations going on about how we can make sure people are safe. There is, there is a piece of work um, to be done around, There is a piece of work around, you know, we, we've we got to be safe with some risk because we can't actually take out all risk. So um, I know when we start talking about vulnerable adults, people start getting very, very, very nervous and very negative around some of the things you some of the things you've explained, but I can assure you there, there's deeper and bigger minds thinking about these issues at the moment. And I would particularly like to have uh, an off, an off, an off recorded conversation with you around some of that. So, um, so Samantha, would you be willing to talk a little bit? You are, you're from Learning Disability Wales, aren't you? Yes. Hi. I'm just. I mean, I echo what. Um. I'm, I know Mark. Um. And I might echo what he said. And again, around the whole risk aversion um, issue, particularly for people with a learning disability. But as I said, that there's still we're still getting a lot of um, sort of calls and inquiries from um, from families in particular who've gone through um, the assessment process now, the new um, social services and wellbeing um, process, and they still get to the end, and it's basically. Yeah, that's all very nice, but this is all we've got to offer. <laughs> so it's still that 
you've got to fit into a box because that's all there is to offer. And and again, it is like uh, as <clears throat> and Damon mentioned, we do have 22 local authorities, 22 different ways of doing things. So it can be a bit of a postcode lottery. Some local authorities are far better and far more innovative than others and willing to kind of look at different ways of doing things. And unfortunately, some local authorities are still not there yet um, and are still very much, this is what we've offered for the last whatever many years and this is what we have now. Um, and again, there's also um, sometimes um, a reticence to... Um, suggest or promote direct payments particularly again in some local authorities um, and again we would like to see a bit more direction from welsh government on this that actually encourages local authorities more to in, to to promote direct payments because there, again there are some local authorities who are very very negative about it and any any families asking about direct payments uh kind of oh no you don't want to go down that route or you know you'll have to you'll, ha you'll become an employer and then you'll have all these these things you'll have to do and and very much putting people off and uh, and we'd like to see that change really and that that actually be encouraged and promoted as, as a way that people can get more person-centered support they can actually design their own package with a direct payment you know and whether they want to get a personal assistant or whatever so as i say i think some local authorities are doing some fantastic work and are really kind of on board with the apps but there are some that are just really not there yet um, I didn't quite catch your name, so if you could just tell me your name, that'd be great. It's Sam, Sam Williams. Hi, Sam. Um, Hi. Um, I'm a board member for Social Care Wales, um, and I know that Social Care Wales are currently doing some work around direct payments and also other issues around that, so I'd be happy to pick up that conversation off off this call with you and um, put you in contact with a couple of officers that might be able to pick that up with you. Um, can I pick up Sam's point though? Um, can I pick up Sam's point? You know, I suppose this is the obvious question for me to ask, mm -hmm. but the point about uh, direct payments and or more broadly personal budgets in the film, Damien, there was a lot of emphasis quite rightly on the, like the conversation that means that you get some support. One yeah. of the, the, the idea of personal budgets, at least as it was originally envisaged, was that part of the conversation becomes, well, you might actually have an entitlement to support, something that's yours by right, and that therefore, if you do, then you should be able to control that and it's not about just a conversation at the beginning, it's about the journey that you go on. I mean, most things that people do interestingly with direct payments or personal okay. budgets happen over time. But if you can't know about your entitlement, it doesn't seem to be any reference to entitlement or money in the film at all. Okay. Um, if I can just come back on the direct payments thing. When we were rolling out the direct payments um some of the some of the sort of take up around direct payments that we were seeing from different local authorities we did a about a six month um engagement piece about why local authorities were using direct payments as a as a sort of punitive piece to actually say to people well if we can't fit you into anything maybe direct payments will work but then actually as people have said on this call giving people fear and really being scared about um them actually taking control but i actually personally use direct payments and i personally use direct payments in conjunction with a health budget how did I manage that to happen? It was because the people I had to speak to had to be an senior enough and bought into the process enough. So like Sam has said, it depends what local authorities you're working with and how bought they are into the process. It's, it's an option in a way, but it's still not really a, a right. No, even effective right. Even though, if you really dig 
deep into the legislation, it is actually one of the preferred options. I see, yeah. But then local authorities are very scared of giving up control. Yeah. So, and that's what we have to deal with. And that's not unique to Wales, in my experience. No. <laughs> I mean, so there's some other questions coming in. Maybe well, I'm going to scan those questions for you, Damien, and invite some others to come in. But what I would particularly, maybe you could say a little bit more about in, in preparation for this. You thought, you said that there were some, maybe some lessons for England or other countries from Wales um, that, that make this approach in Wales distinctive and interesting. Would you like yeah. to maybe emphasize uh, that a bit? I, 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 I personally think the, for all the negatives of the act, I really think that the Welsh government were really forward thinking in what they were trying to do. Again, I come back to turning this big juggernaut around. But actually, I think looking at your Care Act in England, some of the questions that I have are, it's just different language being used. But it's, it's never, from what I've read about your Care Act, it doesn't seem to really have um, conversations up, up front. And I think after COVID, especially, I think that we are going to have to really have a, I'm going to be slightly bold here and say that we really need to have a global conversation about first welfare and also secondly about the, the social care system and say to people, actually, if you want certain things, we might have to look at the way things are structured. So my, my, my question back, I suppose, is I think, I think a lot of what happened in Wales in the Social Services and Wellbeing Act is just replicated in the English legislation, but it was first done in Wales. And maybe we are not as far along as I'd like us to be, but also it's always great to design an act after one's already been done, I suppose, is my point. Um, Bob, you, you've worked in England and in Wales. Um, maybe you'd like to kind of give your perspective on some of the things Damien's been talking about. Yeah, yes. Simon, um, Damien and I have had quite a lot long chat about this recently. I, I really enjoy working in Wales, and I enjoy working in Wales because of uh, it's easier to um, escape from the constraints on a local basis when you're working with people that want to. Um, but I, th I think in the in, in the film that was shown at the beginning, some of the problem that exists in Wales and, and, and could be rectified um, probably much more easily than it is in England is the, the fact that still this notion of um, self-direction has been as is couched in terms of individual citizens. Um, I think we can probably claim some of the credit for the word conversation appearing so often because of, you know, that's the work we were doing in Monmouthshire 12, 15 years ago, where we we changed with Julie Boothroyd and others, we changed the the way in which um, coalface social workers in, in some parts of, of, of that authority um, related to people. But um, in, in, in going back to the film, um, there's this very bland statement that says you have responsibility for your own well-being. And what seems to be missing from that screen to me is we all have a responsibility for each other's well-being. And if we're going to take that seriously, and some of the stuff around the conversation does in terms of looking at family, friends, community networks, then you've got to take that stage further where... Um, it, it, essentially, you organise and systematise your services to be local so that the people that are having those conversations as helpers actually can, can extend that and work with it um, in, in a different way and not just be arriving at a plan. And then, uh, you know, which you know, was also very obvious in, in, the, um, in the film. The, the hope is that they're going to arrive at something which means they don't have to do anything long term. Um, 
and for a lot of people that isn't true. So essentially, I think that that's the fundamental issue. But I think we're a, a lot further forward in Wales than we are in England in terms of being able to have this sort of conversation. Um, and you know, you know, Damien and I are very keen to develop the centres involvement and and um, the citizen network involvement in Wales as as a as a if you like a plank or a forum um, where these sorts of debates can be developed because of it's so hard to do it. Part of my part of part of my willingness to undertake this um, conversation today was to start the conversation with you guys and say actually we we as a collective can help me sort of learn from all aspects. So even this conversation will help me advise on certain bits which I'm advising on at the moment and also bring you into wider conversations. I'm not saying Wales has got the sort of fix all, but I'm saying Wales is sort of there when it comes to let's have a conversation with the citizen. I, I totally agree with some people on this call. Certain voices aren't getting listened to. And as I said earlier on, I would personally like to strengthen that voice for those particular categories of people. But I think Wales is doing a lot with quite a lot of resistance. And I think some some positive changes moving forward will be that you will um, see that more and more of this is actually given to the partnership boards. But I also have I, ha I also have concerns about partnership boards being too overly managed by health. But that's for a different day. Yeah, and well, Sarah had an interesting point. Um, so maybe Sarah Holmes would like to come in. I think around conversations and assessments and some of the hazards about that. So Sarah, would you like to just amplify your point from the chat? There we go, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, um, I think like to pick up on um, one of Damien's earlier points, I think it's quite important to recognise we, we use quite different language in England than what is used in Wales. Um, and so I think one of the things we can do as, as a collaborative of people is to build a shared vocabulary and, and better understanding of, of perhaps when we're talking about the same thing but using different um, words and language to describe those things. Um, so that would be my first point. Um, in, in England, in, in, within the CARE Act, there, there's an emphasis on what they call the wellbeing principle, which is very similar to what I was picking up from the video we watched at the beginning. Um, and the, the language uh, in, of the CARE Act is all about um, asset-based uh, or strengths-based working. Um, and the, the principle of, of an assessment under the CARE Act in England is that uh, it's supposed to be an asset-based conversation, which um, starts with what's strong in the person's life, uh, how are they connected, what resources are available to them, mm. how well are they networked in their community, what relationships do they have in place around them but unfortunately because of the archaic and traditional commissioning system and processes that we have which is probably similar to Wales yeah. um, what we've had is we've moved across to the new legislation we've moved across to the new uh, terminology but quite often the process remains the same so the social worker is the the designated person responsible for carrying out the assessment uh, and uh, what they're doing immediately is jumping to the diagnostic label, the eligible need and the, uh, the risk element. Um, so straight away, the conversation is not starting from a place of, of strength and asset. Um, so I think although we, we do a lot of using the nice language and the box ticking and everything, I think in practice it comes back to the same kind of comments really. The act is good. Um, the values underneath it are, are good and if they're uh, translated in the right way we can see some really good results but uh, because the system and the processes are still 
in effect the same and and obviously we've had austerity piled on top of that as well um so you know teams have been restructured and made smaller and and people carrying the statutory duties have to make sure that 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 their priority is managing risk and meeting essential critical priority need all the time so actually the the first thing to go out the window when that happens is the conversation um and I, I really do think that that's, that's what's missing. I think it would be really good to do some joined up working where we can compare and contrast our language and our terminology. Um, I put in the comments earlier um, that I'm, I think I'm right in saying this, Damien, you don't use the term personal budget, do you? No, in, we don't. In your, ter in your terminology. We, we do not. We do not. And there is a whole piece around the first minister that we've got now was the health minister and when he he was asked to look at personal budgets he had a real difficulty around actually people being given money before services were delivered because actually then it wouldn't fit in line with the nhs being f free at the point of delivery but actually, there is a lot of there is a lot of conversations going on at the moment regarding that. So um, all I can say is watch this space. And um, basically, what I would say is I know from a non-exec's point of view, and from somebody that lives through the policy, I would love to see a joined up language across the UK for social care. So when people might might start off living in Wales and then decide that they want to come and live in Yorkshire, um, that they can have the same conversation and, and get the same outcomes. Because at the end of the day, we are citizens of the UK. Well, so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> So the uh, one of I put a link in the chat. Mark was asking this point. I remember from the days of running in control that for a little while we had a kind of in control Wales that then became a different group. I think Mark, you said it was the that sounds right to me. The um, coalition. I forgot, I've lost the track of it now. The Welsh Alliance of Citizen Directed Support, and it struck me that um, actually over the last four or five years I've been working internationally and in Europe and we've developed a self-directed support network. So it's one of the things that citizen network platforms is a global network. And we don't actually have a Welsh representative on that, in that network at all. So we've got, um, you know, in control Scotland, the center for welfare at Forum, organizations in Australia, the States and across Europe, but not Wales. So, and maybe that is also like Sarah says, a bit of an opportunity to um to start normalizing some of this stuff in a kind of saner way does that make sense so we we start to find a shared framework globally for some of this thing because they were basically it's about i mean i would i would say damien it's maybe less about being a uk citizen and just being a citizen with yeah. human rights and yeah. these same issues occur in every country yeah um what I just wanted to come back on, Bob made some really good points that if you show the evidence to ministers and officials in Wales, they are receptive. So it depends how you frame those conversations. And this is a plea to the centre and to the Citizen Network. Use your knowledge and show Wales what you've already done. Because believe me, people in Wales will listen, but they like to see the evidence. Good point. Okay, Who, anybody else like to come in, ask Damien a question? I can keep firing questions, of course, but <laughs> any, uh, anybody? Oh, Mark, come back, Mark, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm saying quite a lot, but um, I, I understand what you're saying about Welsh Government. Um, but Welsh Government are miles away from what's on the ground, structurally. 
And so for me, and even the regional partnership board, so I got, we've got North Wales one that covers six local authorities, is too far away from people on the ground. So what I think is missing, I don't know, and I'd be interested in your point of view, is creating much more localised, even local authority based networks made up of, that are co-produced, that include disabled citizens and breaking out of the silos within disability, uh, maybe carers and working alongside organisations and pr practitioners equally yeah. to look at how the principles of the act are happening, mm -hmm. not to bash local authorities, mm -hmm. but to work with them to say, we've got these principles, but sometimes it appears that those principles aren't being put into practice because nobody's really checking. And it seems to me that it's still to a degree dependent on leadership, who the local leader is, the person in the position of power as to how far they go with the act. I, I'm just interested in what you think about that. Um, I've got I've got two thoughts on that. One, I totally agree with you. I I I think that we need to decentralise some of the major decision making processes more to community level, but also I think um, coming very soon there will be a lot more around um, citizen engagement and citizen um, participation because all of the work that's been done around community health councils in Wales under a new piece of legislation which was just about to get royal assent um, in, in Wales before COVID is going to be looking at social care as well. So I think, I think some of those community-based focused groups will enable people to have stronger voices and hold some of these um, system leaders to account because those organizations will be run by citizens and um, they will be able to hold local authorities and health boards and partnership boards to account. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll be really honest with you, I think, I think we need to have really strong conversations because every time I work on um, a piece of work which is the looking at the sort of where is the best practice it's always we go to wonderful projects like in North Wales and we see stuff and then advisors come back and say how can we scale it up and it always gets it always gets lost because people either want to keep the power where they are or they want to um they, they don't think they don't think it'll fit with their particular demographic of area that you're trying trying to scale it up into so i'd be really happy to see citizens having a stronger voice across the piece you want to come in bob yeah i just wanted to come in on the basis of i think there's there's another conspiracy another really really important component to this which is um, everything comes back looking at practice when in fact um, where the problems are and I think Mark referred to it earlier are in the structures and systems and repeatedly um, you know, I, I've worked with John Seddon's crowd I've introduced Damien recently to Simon Pickthall who's um, Vanguard's lead in Wales um, we've worked with um, social care leaders in Wales, taking them down on the ground to look at the consequence of their systems. We've had very, very um, macho directors of social services in tears when they've realised the implications of what they were doing because they were only being fed back up the system with, with information that related to the system. It didn't relate to reality at all. Um, and, you know, one of the central messages I hope Damien's going to take back to central government is um, uh, to, to the Welsh government is um, stop looking at practice for a while and start looking at how systems affect outcomes because if, if we can get the systems right then it's possible for people to do what they know is right as practitioners. Yes. I, oh sorry go on Damien. I totally agree with you Bob and and as you know we've had 
we, we had an hour's conversation a couple of days ago and I'm already formulating some ideas that I was going to come back to you on. So, um, so and Liz Leach, you had a question as well, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of a question and I guess an observation really. Um, I think there needs to be a real shift, doesn't there, to move away from uh, discussions about how we do things <laughs> Um, from that authoritative perspective to really thinking about community. Um, and what really interests me and what I'd be really keen to know more about is for Wales, Wales has got such a diverse range of communities running throughout the country. You, you, you've got quite major city centres, but then very, very rural communities as well. And it'd be great to learn about how them communities have held the resilience and the connection and how communities and people within them have, have been there for one another because I, I imagine that that's where a lot of the answers um, are held about how things work for people and how um, people find the support that they need. And what fascinates me is how we're still in a position where there's such a huge void between just life and what we do for each other quite naturally and the services that are there to set up to support life yeah. and until that void until it stops being a parallel universe <laughs> and it meets somewhere that it starts to make sense um, I think we will continue to have systems and structures that jar against what naturally works for people and I, I think it would be really good to have some conversations around how can we how can we um, bring that closer together. Yeah, one of the one of coming back on your point, Liz. One of the biggest things that came out of the social services and wellbeing act was community connectors. But e even though um, there is a there there was standardised ways of doing it after they have being imposed for about. A year, it depends about that individual actually walking the streets and collecting the narrative because there were still some community connectors not actually really understanding that actually you can't communicate, you can't connect people unless you're actually with them. You actually, they were trying to do it from an office, so it was, they were trying to do it on my computer screen, oh, that, that service will work for um, Doris. You know, let's connect, uh, but let's actually not see whether the next door neighbor might be able to help as well. So it's about, you've got to, you've got to empower people. And it's something Bob always says, that you, you've got to empower people to do proper old fashioned social work. And that means, sometimes having really difficult conversations to take away some of the structures. Before you can help someone, you might have to undo quite a lot of the structure. So I think, I think a piece of work that was done by um, the University of South Wales was um, really sort of building up an evidence base of how good community con connection can be done because it's amazing the power of communication and the conversations you might be able to help someone but it might be because you're you're just their next door neighbor and you know that's where I think that we are looking sometimes for the state to do too much does that make sense Liz yeah, it does. And I think sometimes as well, it is two ways, isn't it? There's, I've experienced um, um, occasions where people have really put together a lot of thought into what makes sense to them. And the input from the local authorities is a very small part of that whole big picture of what really would work for them. Yeah. And the person has started to communicate that back to the local authority and the service structure. And that conversation hasn't fitted with how things are done from within the service. So that, that whole picture that the person's created has started to be deconstructed 
into something that then, then makes sense for the service. Yeah. And if, even individuals being told that the, the service doesn't need to know about that part of the person's life. They just need to know about how the budget's going to be spent. <laughs> yeah. And that just doesn't make sense, does it? Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a bit of personal story here to actually illustrate the point. I, as I said earlier on, I use direct payments. I'm, I'm a really strong advocate for direct payments, but I have to use, I have to use a healthcare, and I have to use a sort of um, input from healthcare to achieve that. But act, actually, when, when I, when I was trying to get that done. Health were saying we can't communicate and we can't we can't support you through direct payments. And I said, well, actually, there's a vehicle for me to have a better quality of life. Then I couldn't find a PA that was skilled enough to. So I said, well, actually, my husband's a qualified carer. Can I use my husband? And they were, oh, it says says you can't use family members. Well, actually. If it works for me and it delivers the outcomes, surely that makes sense. But the amount of bureaucracy I had to jump through, I don't think the general population in England or Wales would be able to advocate for themselves. And that's why I truly believe in in sort of some of the work that you do, Liz, around actually giving people the the sort of power and safety to say this is how I want my life to be so I can imagine my life being like this because like you said many people tell ser services so much that actually puts up more barriers so only tell them what they need to know I suppose Okay, We're, we've come to the end of time, so we were still full of questions and things, but I think I'm going to um, thank the audience um, for some great questions and some great points. I'm going to thank tremendously Damien for giving this talk, I think for doing a very good job of representing what's exciting and interesting about um, these developments in Wales, which are clearly rooted in powerful values, even if there's some journey to go on as, as there is everywhere in the world, as far as I can tell, to make those values come to life. Um, and also for representing those values so well in your own life, Damien, and, and for articulating those ideas to us all so clearly um, and living there. Um, so thank you so much for that. I want to remind people that the Centre for Welfare Reform and Citizen Network are in the process of building this work around neighbourhood democracy. Wales has got much more local government than England. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing because it means that local government's a lot smaller, a lot more human. And that maybe that's where some of the kind of humanity that you've described, Damien, comes from, is that people are not quite so distant. Even as Mark says, it still feels pretty distant sometimes, bureaucracy, but come to England if you want to really be <laughs> super distant bureaucracy, I guess. Um, and also, I, I think I made this point earlier, but I would like to just reinforce it to, especially to all our friends from Wales on this call. There is a global community around self-direction. It would be really great to have a, a strong voice for Wales in that, inside that community and being able to share international learning into Wales, but also sharing the Welsh experience into that international community. So if anybody wants to work with Damien and me on how we might build on that, um, then please do get in touch after this call. Damien, do you want to say any last words before I cut everybody off? <laughs> to, to anyone that wants to reach out to me, reach out to me using um, LinkedIn and I'll be happy to have um, virtual coffee in this time of lockdown with you, but I'm, I'm sure there's many voices on this call that I can listen to, learn from, and take back to the powers of influence and try and make sure voices like yours get listened to. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Damien. Thanks everybody who's on the call. This will be posted up probably next week, but um, please stay in touch. We'll be doing regular webinars. There's another one next Friday. Varun Vidyarati from India will be talking about um, happiness and the keys to citizenship and the wisdom of East and West. So that's a, a one to look forward to, I think. Um, and um, the many more things as well. All right. Have lovely weekends. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Bye for now. Bye.